time here, so uh, unless it's real important. Okay. Ken, could you touch upon my broken rudder cable so everyone here in the two seater are aware of that place? We will do that. Okay. Bill? No, sir. Uh, on the uh, carburetor float, I just had mine done on the last annual. I've got a new metal float in there done by Bob Tobacco. I notice now when I flick on my uh, auxiliary pump prior to starting, uh, it will not hold fuel pressure. I turn it on, build up five pounds, turn it off. It will not hold fuel pressure when cold. It will hold it when hot. Bad? I don't know. I've never heard of that before. You've got to have it checked out. It should yeah. work that way, man. Well, we've seen that in flight school way back in the 70s, that that was a seating problem on the valve, not on the float. Okay, so and that's what it, I was if, if the valve is not seating perfectly, you're going to lose did, that pressure. Did he change your valve and seat, needle valve and seat? Uh, change the float. I presume the needle valve was changed too, but I don't know. Okay, have him check it out. Yeah. That's probably the problem. I, thank you, Maynard. Back in the back. Yes, a while back you started talking about nose wheel shimmy. I've been trying to get back to it ever since. Can we get back to it? We have what? Okay. There was one other hand up back there. Let me catch it and then we're going to get on this. Fuel tank leaks. Okay. Only happened while we're in the plane. Okay. Talking about four place airplane, right? Okay. Yep. If it hasn't already, it will. <laughs> have a way of leaking. That's why they call them wet wings. <laughs> they can leak in a variety of different places. Some of them are easy to fix, some of them drive mechanics drive a wall. And I got a bald head mechanic out there, his hair looked like you after he saw it, discovered a sparley. Uh, uh, the, uh, if you've got a spar leak, definitely that sucker is poured out at one end or the other, either outboard or inboard, around your spar in the center, it's going to make a big mess and you can quickly identify it. And you'll probably have drooping rubber and all kinds of stuff on there. There is a couple other things. A fuel transmitter leak will cause that. You pray for a fuel transmitter leak. That's very easy. If you got a spar leak, we were taught a long time ago by Bruce Fortin from the factory who spent a week with us sealing about 18 airplanes. The first thing you do is you just jerk the wing off, flip it upside down on a saw bar, pull the access cover so you can get in there and work on it, scrape the old sealant out. You put in a combination of two sealants, uh, PR1422, I think is the standard tank sealant, and then you put on the one the manual doesn't tell you to use, which is PR1435, which is a brush sealant. You can fuel over that. You've got to let the first one cure for a significant amount of hours. You also use PR1435 to seal your access panels back with. Don't use the PR1321, I think it is, that they originally called out because that's biodegradable with 100 low lead and auto fuel. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, you will stop your leak until it starts leaking again sometime down the road. <laughs> Grumman, four place owners, Mooney owners, a number of other airplanes that have wet wing airplanes, Pipers, some of these, uh, this is a problem we live with. They generally aren't cheap to fix, but you got to make sure you get the right stuff. For God's sakes, don't even let anybody talk you into putting sloshing compound in it. It ain't legal for one thing that gums up your drain valves for another, and it could plug up your whole fuel system to stop your engine. That pulled virtually like digging chewing gum out of sump tanks. Also, what I found was uh, I had a second leak and you on the uh, 78 tigers and cheetahs and you have uh, the scupper drain that goes down through the tank. Yep. A piece of aluminum sticks up on the bottom. Mm -hmm. You have a nail-shaped piece of aluminum. It cracked and I was just pouring out. Mm -hmm. Cool. When you were sitting on the, the tarmac, what I did is just open up that inspection plate and extended the rubber all the way down. Okay. It works. It works great. It's a lot cheaper. Your other option is to put in a whole new piece. That means tearing up the tank and everything else. It's easier to... It works it great. I hadn't heard of that one before. Dave, why don't you come up here and take some of these questions give me a little break on some things. <laughs> What's that sealant number again? Okay. The, the second one I mentioned is PR1435. <laughs> It's PRC is the manufacturer of it. That's for the access panels and that's your secondary sealant inside. And 
Dave, do you remember the number for sure? Is it PR 1422? Yeah. Is the dark brown stuff? Yeah. yeah. Okay. PR 1422 is the first application you use on that. This has nothing to do with maintenance. Do we have box lunches scheduled in the air if you're going out? Okay. Uh, we need to count. Okay. Never took the count, so it's too late. Fine. So we have taxis set up to take us out to the airport. Same deal as yesterday. Yeah. That's why we got to hurry up and get out of here. We don't have free tickets. No, the taxis will be there. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about nose gear shimmies. Mine and Dave's paper so Okay, Dave. Go. On a, on a field sailor, there's, a, there's another compound that sets up a lot of mass. Thank you. On a, on a high adhesion field sealer, that's what you want to use inside the fuel tank. And you want to use a low adhesion sealer on the inspection plates. Some of them are compatible. You can use them on both, uh, both places. But what you're doing is sacrificing a, a weaker sealer inside the tank where you want a hard sealer, or you want a very firm, solid sealer. And, and to be able to pull your plates off, use it on your plates. What I, what I recommend using is Pro Seal 890. And that, that's in for inside the tank. It sets up quicker than several others. I have, I sell a seal pack, which I don't remember the name on it. It's, uh, I think it's a 208. Uh, and uh, it also sets up fairly quickly. The quickest stuff, if you're in a hurry to go, you use a, you use a Pro, uh, it's Pro Seal 247. But it's very expensive. It's like thirty, I think it's thirty-eight dollars for a little can of it, and uh, it'll set up in about one day. But and it's, and it's about two and a half times the price of the eight ninety. There's A, B, and C, and it's different uh, viscosities. One is brushable. One you put on with the knife, almost like the real heavy paste. They're all identical. It's just the viscosity of the liquid. Right. Okay. Uh, talk about blueprint. I mean. Shimmy, 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 shimmy. Okay, nose gear shimmies. We got a good demonstration a couple, three times of up and down shimmies, side to side shimmies, and I don't know what kind of shimmies out there. Uh, the lady in the red sweater back there, which was yours, up and down or sideways? Uh, I was on the ground watching them. Uh huh. Sideways. Sideways. Okay. I saw one airplane come in and it was just going like that almost until it stopped. Okay, if you've got that type of shimmy, your nut that holds the whole apparatus on and or your shimmy dampeners probably needs either adjusting or some maintenance. There can be a variety of things wrong that cause that. A bent nose strut can cause them to track funny, but generally it's because the thing is too loose. Up and down shimmy ain't got nothing to do with that. You got an out of balance or out around nose tire. Or the tube inside is not right for the tire. Do you ever pick up an aircraft inner tube and look like it had a patch on it? That's a weight. Okay, that's for balancing that thing, and it probably was balanced to a different tire than what you got on there. Anytime you change a nose tire, you probably should also change the tube. And uh, then, if somebody can possibly balance that little sucker, and there are balancing machines and everything, it's a good idea to do it. You get a pretty good idea to put by putting it on and spinning the thing up with an electric drill with a buffer in the thing. That's right. Repeat the question, please. The old uh, 4000 series mag, like 4050 and 4051 series mags were a non rebuildable mag, and the factory recommended replacing them at 800 hours. Uh, I know people have flown them to 1500 hours, but. Uh, uh, that's not a good idea at all. Uh, they, they sell, uh, back in 79, they came out with a 4150 and a 4152 series mag, which is also a non-rebuildable mag. And uh, they only made that for one year, which is, it's, it's the same thing. 800 hours, you, you throw it away. After that, they came out with a 4200 series mag, which is a 4250, 4251. And uh, that was uh, uh, good for as, as long as until it started running bad, and they recommended re replacing. Uh, well, it had to be overhauled at 800 hours, which uh, the overhaul is usually more expensive than replacing the mag because uh, just just adding the parts, and the coils, and the, and the, uh, the seals and the points and all the things that they want to put in there, it came out to the parts by themselves and the wholesale was more than the mag cost. So it's easier just to change the whole mag. Rather than going back to the, the newer slick mags, it'll give you a hundred bucks on the trade. That's right. What, what would you recommend for, for mags in the 108? Like 
Well, I, I recommend the slick, the 4250, 4251, or uh, on the, go ahead and go with the newer slick max. Um, some people up in cold country, they like more spark. They say the Bendix puts out a little more spark than the, than the slicks. Uh, I, I don't really know that since the 4200 has a slightly larger coil in it than the, than the older 4, 4 pound series. <coughs> Um, we've had the, really had more problems with 4200 series max than the old 4000 series, but uh, they, at least they are rebuildable. And when the points wear out, you can change them, and, and there's no problem if you want to change the whole max. It's my connector. How about that rudder cable? Uh, did you discuss that? Well, I don't have my, my AD notes, but on the early travelers, uh, I think it looked about serial 409. Uh, you know, well, we're talking, and we're talking Yankee with a, with a broken cable. And, but the traveler, and the traveler and the Yankee have a very similar control system. They're almost identical to each other. Well, okay, all the way up through the one seeds, they're all the same, except uh, the size of the pulley group is located right underneath the trim wheel. It's uh, just slightly behind the trim wheel. There's a series of about eight pulleys there for your ailerons, your uh, your rudder, your, and your uh, elevator. And uh, the early airplanes have a small pulley in there that had they put a bind on the on the cable where it actually touched the pulley, and they they fray there. And there's an AD note out to inspect that every hundred hours in all your travels. I think it's up to 409. Now on your on your AD1. If I'm not mistaken, there's a service bulletin out on that for the inspection. It's, but, I, but I don't know. I, I don't remember. The A1s and the A1As. The AD's and the AD's. Okay. You check that. Okay. Or you yeah. change it with the bigger pulleys. This was a 1B and had a bigger pulley. Well, I, I think this had small pulleys. I don't want to look at it. It did? Yeah. yeah it, it had, that airplane had small pulleys. Right? And there is, I know there's a bulletin. I guess it's on the AD on the, on the AD1. Also, but uh, go ahead and replace it with a larger, later model pulley. Group. And, uh, Does the cable break at the pulley? Right at the pulley, yeah. Well, the other one was frayed too. There was one of them frayed real bad, uh, and one of them was broken. Okay. You're, you're allowed. You're allowed three broken strands. I think. Is the way that what do you do if it breaks in the air? <laughs> Don't make it rudder. I don't know if it's full right rudder. Someone causes two fights. It runs fine, but when it hits 180 on the oil tank, it starts to miss like crazy. Well, what is it now? It's a two places, an A and one B. It runs fine on the ground, you fly for about five minutes to ten minutes, it hits 180 on the oil temperature, and it starts to misfire. Okay, the mag has been changed, the carburetor has been checked, it's a problem they can't find. It's 180, and that's it. It just starts to starts to misfire. Yeah, I heard the word battle players over here, and that's that's very important on the A1. They, it's recommended to check your clearance every hundred hours. This happened. In fact, this happened after it was top overhaul. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right after a top overhaul or an overhaul, fly the airplane. You know, do a, do a run in on it on the ground. Inspect your valve clearances. Then fly it ten hours. Re-inspect your valve clearances. If this isn't done, those circuits will probably tighten up on you. You get that? It gets a little hot. You know, the engine gets warmed up. It's going to miss. Smart. Just do all kinds of weird things. You're going to burn those valves right up. Okay. Solid lifters on the O235 series engines. That's that's what it is. They, you adjust it just like on your shitty. And uh, yeah, there was a, a 150 on the field that did the same thing. Collapsed valve lifter then maybe. But what it turned out to be was the only way we found it was we got it hot, did a quick compression check. It went up was real hot. And we found the cylinder. Everything checked out fine, still with the cylinder. Finally pulled the cylinder off and found a crack in the top of the cylinder. Okay, yeah, you just lose the compression. You got one cylinder missing then. Um, uh, what is the advantage, disadvantages of the uh, in the brake uh, shoes whatever being like steel or chrome or stainless steel? Chromes don't rust. 
Okay, I mean, are they worth the extra cost and everything? Yeah. 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 Especially yeah. if you yeah. didn't hear the yeah. other they, they had a lot of problems with them for a while, but it seems they got it all ironed out now, and they're working real good. Perry? Yeah, I put chromes on mine uh, a year and a half, uh, two and a half years ago. I still have, with the annual inspection, the pucks, the regular puck, not the hard puck, are still good. Uh, and I was changing, I was changing on the heavy duty pucks every six to eight months. Well, you take a look at a lot of these, you, you take a look at a lot of these brake, this, brake rotors out there and you'll find that the things look like about 10 grit sandpaper or grinding stones. Okay, that's going to grind your brake pucks right off real quickly. You, you had your hand up there a second ago, uh, you go ahead. Have you had any experience with uh, spinners rubbing on the cowling with new motor loads? Yeah. What do you do for that? There's a little thing in the parts catalog that ports to a little washer back uh, right at the at each engine mount pad. And the nomenclature out there that tells you how many to use is A slash R. That means as required. That is your adjustment. <laughs> Trial and error. Trial and error, right. Yeah. I noticed on my uh, elevator, on the one side every once in a while, it's, uh, it's rubbing slightly. And if I just take it to kind of... You got a tiger? Yeah, move it slightly, and then it's working fine again, but later on it'll be... Okay, what that is is back at the back, and that thing, you're, you've got a heat expansion of that ABS plastic that is something wild. That's also why dorsal pins break. I mean, those suckers curl around like a worm. Okay? You get it, especially if it's a dark paint on the thing. That thing gets hot, those suckers are pinching toe in. I've actually had them bind up. We've done exactly the same thing you did, just reefed on them and got the things out. I would advise you, though, the next opportunity to remove the elevator tips and go back in the back and trim a little bit of that plastic off where it butts up against the metal in the back to give you a little more clearance up front. Also, inspect around the front. You've got a metal uh, rib inside of that thing that it screws to. If your plastic is extending past that, get a file, file it off. You can do it without doing anything other than raising and lowering your elevator. Yes? Uh, do you know anything about uh, stainless uh, brake discs? I saw an ad in, uh, I think, ALPA magazine, something in Tennessee is making stainless discs now. I know someone I've, heard them. Them. I, I've heard of them. I've also heard that they're not approved yet, or they weren't some time back. They are Jack? approved. I put them on my airplane. The guy makes them in uh, Upper New York State. Huh? How much do they cost, Jack? Uh, they cost me 165 bucks. Each or set. And also he sells a pad, and they work great. Is that each or for the set? 165 bucks for the set, that sounds like a pretty good buy to me. Yeah. And stainless steel should be better than chrome. Yeah. Well, he's got a comment on that. One of the major trade magazines had an article on that where they compared a stainless to a chrome. And uh, the stainless was wearing out. The brakes were very fast. It, it wouldn't transfer the heat as well. Not, I, I'm going to get you. Yeah, your, I know yours works. It <laughs> uh, works great, man. But maybe we can clear that up. Uh, the, the, article, the article said that the stainless just wouldn't conduct the heat like the, the mild steel would. That was like the chrome. And uh, they had lots of problems. So I, if, if you get a stainless, then maybe you should get it when that, that his, he says his is working real good. It's not wearing his pucks down. But the problem they had in the magazine article was that the puck was getting too hot. All the heat was staying in the pucks and it, it, it burned right off. Okay. Uh, one other comment. I also bought the pads from him and I've been checking my pads uh, continually. And I've, I've had them now, on now for about four or five months. That's what new. There's probably a special pad to go with them. Yes, he sells the pads too. He sells the pads also. How many hours? There's, there's a guy on Arpio that has an STC for a car, okay? And his is around 135 bucks. He uses the normal pad because he uses a different harder steel, okay? Because obviously you can get stainless steel on any, any you know, harder that you want, also the iron content. The only thing that we've ever found was if you're coming in for touch and goes, well, you shouldn't be on your brakes that much anyhow on a go. But if you're coming in and making full stop landings, taking off and making full stop landings, yeah, they do hold, they start to get, the, they won't dissipate the heat, all right, as quickly as the iron roll, all right? But uh, the only people that really are doing that are, you know, 
flight school. I don't think any of us make, you know, full stop landings and take right back off and full stop landings like you would at flight school. Well, we just use steel in our flight school because they, we fly every day. And we don't have any rust problems. No. That's the, only, that's the only real derogatory problem with the originals is the fact they sit around and they rust up. If you're in the middle of New Mexico someplace and you don't have a rust problem, uh, you fly your airplane every day like it's done in flight school, uh, you're not going to have a problem with them. Uh, one thing let me mention, you guys that have got information on stuff like this, please get whatever information you can, preferably a brochure or something, write your experiences, your hours, and this type of stuff, and mail it to me at the post office box and just mail it to AYA Star, Attention Editor, and I'll know it's for the newsletter. That thing's got a stack of mail like that in it, it's easier to sort. And uh, but please give me enough information and to report on this in the maintenance tips section in the newsletter, new products, and this type of thing. You possibly bought our Tiger after you talked about this sensitive prop. But we changed from the Macaulay to the sense, and if we're very pleased with it, which also required the new spinner. The reason we went to the sense, it was we, the 200-hour AD had not been complied with as far as die checking the hub previous to our purchase. And when we took it into uh, Whirlwind Props in Illinois, and they split the adapter from the prop, the back plate of the spinner was cracked almost all the way around. And you could not see it until it was split. So for those people running Tigers with the Macaulay prop, you may have a, a mechanic that's die checking without splitting. You can't die check it without splitting it. Well, that's what I'm saying. It was written in our book that it had been die checked. And we went back to that mechanic, and all he did was put die around that whole assembly. Wow. You, know, you know, I wish that they would quit giving out a and tickets at McDonald's with Big Macs. That's right, but it, it could have been you know, quite catastrophic. Yeah. We were aware of a lot of shaking. Yeah. Then I got your first star. to man, we'll get that prop. You know, because I was aware of it. I don't like a rough running engine. Yep. And I think possibly part of that was that back plate, along with that plastic ring in the front, was spinning. It wasn't tight any longer. That, you can tell it was chafing on the inside. That, that was that normal. That's the first thing that happened. That thing would start spinning. We used to put them in with our TV and everything else, you know, to prevent that problem. Just glue right into the spinner. And uh, if they still crack, they break. That was the most miserable design that anybody ever came up with on a spinner. If you're flying one of the old style spinners, get rid of the darn thing. How much? Yeah. 413 bucks is the price of that new one, and that's not bad compared to a similar spinner from Piper or others. I mean, it's worth it because you're going to see it against the surface well, of the engine. The last one I had, and we know it's from Way Arrow, in their last catalog, you'll see underneath some part section, uh, they have seat tracks for the Grumman for $15.95 a pair. They are not seat tracks. It, they're canopy tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you can't buy canopy tracks for $15.95 a pair. What we noticed yesterday, we just had the aircraft painted. We put the new Teflon rails in with the new tracks, and I tried a product called LPS. Now, I don't know whether it's approved or not. It's not You're talking about for, for looping canopy tracks? Right. Don't anything on canopy tracks that's any type of an oil type product whatsoever, period. Never, 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 no, no, no. This is, they claim it's a dry lubricant. And LPS is a gooey stuff. Silicon. Silicon is what you should use or a Teflon dry spray. LPS is I have to take other ones. Anyway, came across for the bomb drop. I had never flown with the canopy open. So we opened it, we're coming in nice, she's flying the airplane, I'm dropping the sand. She rotates, and that canopy slides. I mean, it just started to drift on back on us. So uh, yep. it, it works. Okay, LPS and WD-40 and this type of stuff will work for a while, but it also attracts dirt and grit like a magnet, and it will gum up, and you really build a mess in there, and you gotta tear it all apart to clean it out, which you should do about over six months anyway. So, so now, what do you do? Okay. <coughs> Okay, clean it, okay, you can clean it with uh, a, a variety of stuff, anything that won't eat the Teflon, and there's not too much stuff will hurt it. I used to so spray that we could yeah.
Yeah, silicon spray cleans it and lubricates it real good. Uh, that's what I recommend using the silicon spray carry a can of it with a little red thing sticking out of it you plug into it in your airplane. Every once in a while, give it a shot. Uh, it, it's super stuff. Uh, we tried some stuff called Zeppelon, which is a dry, it sprays on in a clear liquid that dries to a powder. It works pretty good, but it's not as long lasting as silicon. But don't use any oil products on those things. And also don't use oil products on your Teflon brass impregnated bearing surfaces for your controls anywhere. Same effect. It'll eat in and cut up the, the aluminum in there. Yep. Um, I sense a lot of good knowledge with, with you people, but some of us don't live within 15 or 2,000 miles from you. We need at least, I would like to see some advice or information on FBOs or mechanics that are prone to working on Grumman's in our particular districts. This is something I mentioned the other night. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned it in the newsletter. Get me this information on people in your area that are knowledgeable about these airplanes so that we can let other people know about it. I don't know people in East Watusi, Nebraska, but somebody that lives near there does. Because the FBO that we have our plane <coughs> service with is learning on our airplane. <laughs> yeah. Where are you? And you're paying for his education, aren't you? But if it's, a, you know, it's, and, and he's good and, and being mechanically inclined, you kind of look over his shoulder and agree with okay. him. Okay. There's, there's so, if there's somebody better in the area, I'd like to know. Okay, we, we've only got 10 minutes. We're going to have to keep this real short. There's one thing that I want to get back on talking about spinners that is extremely important, and that is installing that new type spinner. No matter what prop you got on the airplane, we are seeing an absolute rash of punched out back plates. Now, here's why. The drive bushings coming through the starter ring gear support assembly are barely long enough to go through the bulkhead, let alone into the propeller. Two of them don't even protrude through it. They're real short. It's a two-man operation to install that spinner. One guy holds it in place firmly. Your alternator belt's going to kick the thing out. You're going to have to really push that thing in to make sure it's seated good. This guy kneels down like that while somebody else puts the prop on and tightens it down. Okay? If you try to put it on by yourself, you think you got it in right, that thing will slip down in between the leading edge of the drag bushing and the spacer, and you tighten it down, it's just like a punch press. And I, we have replaced so many of these things, it's a crime. I've been working with light homing, with Sensenich, with Gulfstream American, trying to get some kind of a service bow and AD or something out on it, and I can't really get them excited because they say, Nobody's having any problem with it. Three-fourths of the airplanes that come into us are punched out. Now, I tried to come up with a longer drive bushing. There is one size longer made by light combing, but it's a sixteenth of an inch longer. Ain't worth changing. I was going to recommend they put it out with a service bullet to replace the two short ones with the two longer ones, but that isn't enough to do you any good. Lycoming is going to have to gear up and make one, or we're going to have to really put these things on right. Anybody working on your airplane that pulls that prop, make them aware of that. If, they, if you can't explain it to them, if they got any questions, call me. Call Dave. Call one of us. Get a hold of somebody. Say thank you. My new spinner arrived Thursday night just when I was sleeping. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Maynard's got something to say on the spinner, too. Uh, I have some very interesting trivia once in a while. But uh, the spinners, how many have the old spinners, first generation on there, uh, the tr cheetahs and tigers? Well, when was the break? My right, spinner's been on there for 10 years. So, okay. <coughs> yes. Now, the cheetahs don't have too much problem with cracking, but the, the, the tigers do. Now, the second generation spinner, when they first came out, I sold three of them to Frank Christensen. Who knows Frank Christensen? You know where those airplane spinners are now? They're on the Eagles. I check with Bob Herendy and Gene Susie every year. How are my spinners doing on your way? Great. Haven't had a problem with them. That second generation spinner is thicker, it's better. You do have problems with punching the holes, as Ken described, but you know how to correct that. If you ha haven't had a crack spinner, you will have a crack spinner with the first one, as well as back plates. So we do recommend you upgrade to it. And we are watching the experts as to how long they're lasting. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
has to do with the sensitive crop. When, when the AI that I worked with put this on the airplane, said, now remember, it's a super crop, da 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 da. But if you hit something with it, we can't reduce the length. Now, does that we couldn't that? reduce the length on the Macaulay either. We couldn't? No. Oh. So let's just say you were unfortunate enough to put a good nick in the end of it. Is this something that can be rebuilt? Or yeah, take a look at Maynard's out there. It, unless you really clip the whole end off of it, there's no thing in the book that says how much of that outboard tip has to meet. Right. It's okay. Outside. You can taper them in a little bit. You can round them a little bit. You can do all kinds of things about it. But look at Maynard's Red 180 horse Yankee out there and look at the shape of the prop tips on that. That's exactly why. We got that prop cheap because of that. Well, okay, I, I asked this question last year of my trainer and I'm going to ask about the Tiger. And that is where the prop should be indexed. I put that new sense inch prop on uh, the day before I left and went up with my mechanic and I look, he looked at me to see what I was thinking and my tack I'm going to go like this and everything is vibrating all over the place and I said this is worse than my Macaulay. 2500 RPM I thought the thing was going to fall apart. So I said well, it wasn't that bad, I'm exaggerating. So we landed again and, he's, and the prop stopped and I said well you index the prop. So he changed it from whatever here over to where my Macaulay was which was where you can pull it through easily. I don't know what position that is. And the prop's beautiful now. So I don't know what you know what's what's it supposed to be and what different. Okay, where it runs smooth is where it's supposed to be. The factory, when they built these airplanes, they'd go out and test fly. If it vibrated, they'd start indexing that prop around until they found out where it was smooth, and that's where it was delivered. Okay. The only reason for putting it in any particular place, other than for that reason, is for propping it. How many of you routinely prop your airplanes? I got a reason. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I'd like to say uh, that that was the reason for the the, the, the ten o'clock, four o'clock Dr. Pepper position or whatever. Uh, the uh, uh, other than for profit, it doesn't make any difference. So on my airplane, it has to stop straight up and down because that's where I like it. It also runs smooth there, so I'll leave it there. Uh, same thing on the Tiger Don and I own. Uh, Bill Wilton was just out, got an ascension uh, prop installed on his tacker and shook like a fool. We brought it back in, turned it 180 degrees, I think it was, ran great. Or it may have been 90 degrees. Bill, are you still here? Yeah. Was it 90 degrees or 180? Back to the position was better originally, though. Uh, 90 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Installed 90 degrees up here. Yeah. Same problem you had. The, the thing, airplanes have a habit of exploding when they get into our shop. Starts, parts start flying off and people don't remember how they, which way they work. We had to look at a photo, I think, of the airplane or something to figure out where, where the thing had set. That here's the problem. Just one quick question, Ken. Uh, on that carburetor float, where they wanted you to go to the metal float, wasn't that AD rescinded? Yes. Never was an AD. Never an AD note. It was a proposed. Proposed. <laughs> but get it done. Yeah, the amount of AD knows the price of the parts would have doubled. It's, yeah. like, it's like the fuel tank. It's going to happen now. Yeah, if it happens, it happens, it will. Get it done. Next time you're into the carburetor, if you're not having a problem now, next time you're into the carburetor, the mechanic's into the carburetor, have him do it. Well, the reason I ask is because I took my old Delicon and Pontiac, which are uh, engine rebuilders. They tore the carburetor completely apart and rebuilt it. And they said I didn't need it, and they left the foam one in. Oh. They checked it, they weighed it, and everything, and they left it. Uh, that's a bad thing for them to do. <laughs> you know, that's bad advice. Real bad advice. That's all I got to say. Well, yep. I read that they uh, rescinded the service that the equipment was going to be pulsing because they felt that if there weren't that many cases, it was causing a problem. And they felt that you would notice fuel on the uh, on the ground before you have that opportunity to pull up and have a difficulty in the air. Oh, all I can say is, is there's a guy back in. Uh, Minneapolis, uh, Tony Nessie. Tony, Tony uh, Nessie. Uh, he wrote a nice story that was published in AOPA Pilot Magazine a couple of years ago. He burnt, burnt the whole front end off his Tiger because it caught fire on landing. Okay, they rebuilt his engine. Went all the way through it. Rebuilt the carburetor. Or I guess I guess they just put the same carburetor back on or something. Didn't change that. And it almost happened again to him. Uh, just like I say, all I can say is, and I'll reiterate, 
change the dad blame thing, get rid of that thing because it is a potential problem you don't need. And when you're up in the air or when you're landing and your airplane's on fire, there's no time to argue about the point. Yeah? Were, were all the uh, uh, late model Tigers that have the fall? All the late model, all the Lycoming engines. That was a traveler that had the... Uh, yeah, that was a traveler that had it. We're talking about all Lycoming engines. Up for about up. Light A3. Yeah, yeah, when they started putting the metal ones in, but I'm, I'm talking about every airplane out there. It's not just ours. This copper is in the problem is only in the Tiger and the Sundown. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. All like only the engines. A4L. Vertical and more. A4L. You've got some problems with that carburetor than the others, but this is a traveler that burned up, friend. Okay? Vertical carburetor. MA, MA4, MA4A. Carburetor. Let's get back to the uh, pop spinners. I bought a uh, 1978 Tiger in 1980, and in the logbook there was a note that the spinner had been changed. Yeah. Does that mean I have a new spinner? If it's an SK143-2 spinner kit, yes. If it's got screws going through the spinner dome and forward to the propeller blades, yes, it's the new one. If it does not have screws up there, it's only got 12 up around the back, it's the old one. If it's not cracked, it's a new one. If it's cracked, it's probably the old one. Come on back to our canopy. The other day, earlier we were talking about right? earlier we were talking about opening canopies all the way. But if you got a traveler with a small tail on it, and you put four people in it, do not open it all the way because you will not close it until you land again. That happened years years ago when we had it back in '74, '75, flying down the beach. And had the wife that had uh, mechanics and his wife and my wife in the back seat and we hot and open the canopy all the way. Would not close both of us could not close that thing because we were no matter what speed we were at. It could increase the speed, decrease the speed. We couldn't get close till we landed. Should have stalled and closed it. Has anybody devised any kind of a retraining strap to uh, to uh, more or less control the uh, uh, mount that would slide back? Has anybody thought about something that would come up that you could attach to the canopy and to your uh, uh, top of your uh, There are detents in the canopy rails. There's little plastic buttons in there. If they're all installed and everything, you can feel a little tug right there. But. Uh, uh, I've never thought of doing that, but it's not a bad idea. Uh, like either a strap or a couple buttons or a bunch of uh, all, all a bunch of bungee cord, something like that. You know, that's one of those things. Figure out on your own, hook it up, your words have at it. You can't explosives on that, but have to stop them for a second. You cannot restrict a means of egress, and your only means of egress is that canopy. So if you alter that, i.e., a restricted retraining, restraining strap, and your passenger unfortunately dies, I'm sure you're going to be held liable. So you, you cannot alter a means of egress of an aircraft. Well, it would be something that you would attach at the time that you were going to open the canopy. It would be the same as a safety belt. I mean, you know, you're you're really a it's a safety belt is here. You're trained to do it. It's approved by the A. Convinced? No, he's, sure. he's got a good point. Like we, we're out of time. I don't so. want to have him put his... You know, like I say, something that you can hook up there that's easy to come off and this, that, and the other. Frankly, if you rig up something like that, it's probably going to get sucked out. Uh, if you do open your canopy in flight, be sure and make sure all your shoulder harnesses and everything are tied down because it'll beat the heck out of the side of your airplane. Okay, we'll see you at the airport. Uh, if you want to set a button, it's leaving pretty quick. We'll another one a little bit later. And, uh, we'll see you out there and uh, get to the judgment. Thank you.